Uh, welcome to uh, another episode of Stock Talk Grammar School Talks. But today we're very honoured. We've got a GB Olympian um, uh, from the hockey world. Welcome uh, aboard, Sean and McKillen. How are you doing? Yeah, all good, thank you. All good. So thanks a lot for joining us. Um, we'll kick off with the first question, really. If you want to go into a little bit about your background and your journey uh, from possibly your school days to, to where you are today. Yeah, no worries. So um, the hockey journey for me started back when I was about six years old, so fairly young. Um, I started at a club, a um, small club called Newark, and I actually didn't play any hockey at school until secondary school. So um, six to about 11, it was just um, playing club. So every Sunday morning I'd go down um, with the juniors and, and go play. Um, got to secondary school, we played a bit of hockey at school in PE lessons. And also we had school team. Now this was on grass. So uh, not the best um, surface to be able to play. Um, when we got a bit older in the school, we were able to go to the leisure centre to um, play on the Astro turf there. And sometimes we would play on tennis courts, but not that much. So, um, yeah, n not most of my hockey was, was played at club rather than at school. Um, so when I was about uh, 13 or 14, I moved hockey clubs to a bigger one in Nottingham called Beeston. Um, that was like the natural progression for me. I'd sort of outgrown the smaller club that I was at. Um, played, played hockey for Beeston then. Um, and then kind of just got my foot in the ladder. So uh, played for Nottinghamshire County um, when I was in the under 15s um, and then uh, played for the Midlands region and then um, got invited for an England trial. Uh, didn't didn't make it the first year, unfortunately. Um, and that cycle repeated, so County, Midlands and then another England trial and actually got in. So then played for England under 16s. Um, and then pretty much worked my way up um, on the international side. So England under 16s, England under 18s, um, captain of England under 21s and GB under 21s. And then um, got trials for the seniors. Um, and yeah, back in 20, no, 2013, I was um, offered a full time position for the GB seniors and took it. And been a full-time hockey player ever since uh, yeah. so I'm really lucky that that's my job and I don't have any other job as such um yeah it's been a been a been a journey to say the least this question just hit home there about a little bit about your your time in Holland and on this series we have obviously a lot of successful people in their fields uh, they went and did a stint abroad in a different culture uh, how valuable was that to you and uh, what did you gain from that experience it was, yeah, so valuable. I was w one of the first ones to really go from England to Holland at a young age. Yeah. Um, lots of the senior players would go for a year after the Olympics when it was a bit quieter and less commitments for the English GB team. Um, so, yeah, I was almost a little bit guinea pig going out there, figuring out what how it would work with balancing, you know, playing yeah. England's 21s and being abroad. Um, I went really young. I went when I was 18. Um, yeah. And looking back, you know, I wasn't ready when I turned yeah. up there. But six, eight weeks down the line, I had grown so much because I was literally just jumped headfirst into this world of unknown, you know, having no friends, no family, no safety net, didn't know the language. You know, everyone speaks English in Holland, so that makes it easier. And just being out your comfort zone 24-7 was a real learning curve. And I certainly grew up and matured a lot quicker than I would have done if I'd probably gone to university or even not gone to university and just, you know, studied elsewhere or went into a job. Um, yeah, I really matured. Um, and in terms of the sport, it was it was a really good time for me to go because at that age, you're still a sponge and you're still learning. Yeah. And to be able to have that quality and quantity of training and a different philosophy of the sport um, was just amazing for me. And I really did develop between the ages of 18 to 20 and, and had an accelerated improvement level compared to some people who I was, you know, similar standard to. They were a bit better than me. By the time I come back from Holland, I was better. 
yeah. um, and and that's due to what I was exposed to when I was out there and and I would you know I would re really really would recommend to people in all sports to go and experience another culture yeah. um go knowing that it will be hard yeah. knowing that you will learn from it um it's not it's not an easy thing to do so when i look at you know professional sports people you know football or rugby or people coming over to england and playing in the premiership and and yeah. they're getting you know bad press because they're not playing well i'm thinking i know but it's really quite difficult for someone to come over yeah, and yeah. adapt to all of it um especially at a young age um oh, yeah really glad i went and would encourage other people to do the same and you touched a little bit upon you, you said that um there's a different philosophy in holland what, what are the major differences do you think from england and holland and in terms of how they view and, and the philosopher about hockey um i think for one their training is was really competitive yeah and maybe that was an age thing you know at 18 school training is not that competitive club training is a little bit competitive but it's it was a different level out there because we were essentially professional athletes with amateur wages but yeah. it was that that mindset so you give everything when you're out there and that was new for me um the second thing was the coach that i had he was all about having no cues so at training you were always moving always yeah. moving you know not always 100 percent sprint 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 but always moving yeah. um always having loads of touches on the ball um you would have specific sessions for just skill work um you know you would always 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 finish a training session with a game like yeah. seven aside eight aside game always and yeah. that got super competitive um so yeah i think that side of things was very different to what i was used to both um, at club training, school training, um, England training, it was, yeah, very different. Um, definitely learned the importance of training hard when I was out there. Um, definitely improved my core skills just because of the time I spent on the balls. Um, and, yeah, how important training is for, for the weekend. Um, and another question we're talking about on this series is a little bit about high performance. What, what does high performance mean to you? So I listened to the High Performance podcast, which uh, yeah. Jake Humphrey does, and can't remember his co-host, but I I love it, Amazing. and I love love people people's answers to this and how it how they all differ. Um, for me, high performance is both the mental and physical ability to sustain um, a high effort and high achievement level under pressure yeah. um being able to do all of those things physically mentally decision making under fatigue under pressure to the correct you know level correct yeah. decision making or you know correct skill execution that for me is high performance but in touching upon role models um obviously throughout your life you have people who've influenced you have you got anybody who stands out who's had a massive impact on you and why yeah, I get asked this question a lot, like, who was my role model growing up? Yeah. Um, now, 25 years ago, when I was growing up, there weren't really many, like, female athletes on TV. There weren't, there wasn't much, you know, column space in the newspaper about female athletes. They weren't that visible. Yeah. Um, so it's difficult for me to pinpoint like you know a, a, a single athlete or that i'd look up to or aspire to be someone that certainly had a big influence on me was my first ever coach mm -hmm. um at that small club that i touched upon earlier newark yeah. um she was called christine ferguson we we were always meant we always had to call her mrs ferguson um she was a little bit of an old school uh if you're late you'll run you'll get in trouble um had that like sternness about her um which made you like respect her and want to do well for her um and she really instilled the importance of like basic skills in 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 me and in the whole club to be honest like you know looking back i used to think it was quite boring but now i'm like thank god like she made us do that and i really yeah. really value the importance of having good core basic skills and i think it kind of shows in my play um, as a senior athlete that I, I do have those and that's not just luck like I practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced um, so she certainly you know helped me 
as a player develop um, and learn some crucial things. Um, another person would be my coach in Holland. He's called Tone Seatman. Just yeah. um, give me confidence that I, I am or I was good enough. Um, he believed in me, which, yeah, was the first time probably I really thought a coach believed in me. Um, and just his tactical knowledge of the game was just incredible and definitely learned a lot from playing with him and under him um and hence why i you know i really enjoy the tactical side of hockey at the moment yeah good and in terms of your coaching holland then you said he believed in you what what things did he do to make you feel like he believed in you um i think the first main thing was just communicating and telling you um yeah. sometimes in the british way is the we're a bit we we sometimes don't mm -hmm. like giving feedback either in a positive way or a negative way we just kind of shy away from it yeah. um and over in holland they're very much that they're, they're direct they'll tell you yeah. whether it's good or bad they'll tell you okay yeah. <laughs> um and yeah he would just tell me that that was good well done yeah. you did really well today and yeah. like i was used to think like oh he's telling me that that's weird like but then he'd also tell you if you weren't good. So, you know, when you when you did play well and you when you did do good things or, you know, he would consistently praise you, you knew that it meant something. Um, so just that like channel of feedback um was yeah, important for me at that stage in my development. And setbacks and accomplishments, life is like a roller coaster, as Ronan Keating once said. <laughs> What, what are your biggest setbacks professionally um, and what did you do to overcome them? Um, injury yeah. or injuries, should I say. Um, not been the luckiest in terms of injuries. So I think since 2014, um, I think I've had an injury which has lasted four or more months every single year, mm -hmm. which is, is tough to take because you, you never... You can go through this cycle where you never think you're going to get over them. You never think you're going to get back to where you were. You never think you're good enough. Um, I think the toughest one that mm -hmm. I faced was in 2018 when I got a concussion and yeah. that left me out of the game for 10 months. Wow. And then I came back for like a week and then I picked up a like a really inconspicuous knee injury, which so I was out of the game pretty much for about 17 months, which, um, yeah, is a, is a significant amount of time. Um, through that time was, yeah, there was some dark, dark patches, um, mm. patches where I just thought I wasn't ever going to be able to live a normal life. And what I mean by that was, you know, I had headaches every day for yeah. six months. You know, I couldn't go out for coffee with a friend because I had just had the most horrific headache. Yeah. I couldn't do, um, I couldn't move my head from left to right without feeling dizzy. Um, I couldn't just live a, a normal life. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really tough having your, um, I guess, yeah, identity taken away from you. Uh, yeah. you know, there was there was long time during that, that time out that I just didn't even think about hockey because I just wanted to just be normal. So. Yeah. For me now, at, since that injury, you know, not taking for granted the days where you can just be happy and healthy throughout the day and not have any pain or, or discomfort anywhere is, is a blessing. And that's something I'll never, ever, ever take for granted ever again. Yeah. Um, overcoming them, finding things that make you happy. Yeah. Simple pleasures in life. Uh, little wins, I used to call them. Yeah. Uh, putting my headphones in, finding a podcast and walking around town for an hour in the sun. Brilliant. Like that used to just reset my mind and it's, it doesn't cost anything. It's okay. quite good for you. It takes your mind away from all the internal thoughts that may be going on. Um, depending on what podcast you do, you might learn something or you might just have a laugh and listen to it if it's a funny one. Um, so that was a little win for me that I used to do a lot. Um, yeah, walking was, was a big one. Um, connecting with people who make you feel good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, you know, yeah. I, I have friends for different things. I have friends that are really good at giving advice. I have friends that are really good for telling me things how it is. I have friends that, yeah. you know, I don't talk to that often, but when I do, it's fun, laid back, 
you laugh all the time, you joke, yeah. and then maybe don't speak to them for two months, and then it's exactly the same. So surrounding yourself with the right kind of energy. Yeah. Um, also, writing stuff down, getting out your head is was a big one for me, um, whether it be like a, a line, two lines, a page, two pages. Yeah. Um, and making sure you touch on like positive things that happened that day. It sounds so basic or things that you're grateful for. Like at the moment, you know, with COVID and lockdown, it's tough, but it seems to be that the weather really helps people at the moment and it's given people a bit of a boost. You know, it's cold in the mornings, but come like 12, one o'clock, the sun's shining and everyone's thinking, okay, things are getting better. Like I'm in my t-shirt, maybe it's a bit cold for a t-shirt, but I'll still be in it um, and things are looking up. So, you know, just, just, I guess, getting out your head and, and trying to switch that mindset of things are rubbish, I hate everything, to actually there are things that are going well at the moment. Yeah, no, good. And that, that's what's hit home with a lot of people I spoke to as well, is they, to overcome setbacks and stuff, they always make sure they have something totally away from what they're doing. Mm -hmm. so it's really, really important to have your time and have something that totally switches you off and have other things in your life. So that's that's really, really good. Uh, and in terms of you mentioned at the start of your journey, you, you went through obviously the England trials and you got knocked back uh, and then went again. What, mm -hmm. what what did you do, obviously, what, and what were you feeling? Obviously, you, you were working towards that England trial and they were just, they basically said at the moment, Tony, you're not good enough. Um, what, what did you do to overcome that? Because that must have been quite tough. And, and what age were you at that time? Yeah, it was a bit. Um, I mean, I'd grown up kind of being one of the best in my age group, whatever team I played in. Yeah. I was always top one, two, three in the team. And then you go to this trial where actually instead of in the top three, you're perhaps in the bottom three. And yeah. you're like, oh, there's other people that are way better than me. Yeah. Um, I think there's, there's two folds to it. One, it was a confidence thing for me. And I always, um, less so now, but when I was younger, I always take a bit of time to like get into things. Um, and I think the first trial, I was just way too nervous. Yeah. And just put myself down. I wasn't good enough. And I, I remember feeling very constrained and not really playing freely. Um, and that was certainly a mindset thing. Um, I wish I was more confident in myself back then and believed in myself a lot more. Um, whereas I would always come off the pitch and be like, I was rubbish, I was rubbish, I was rubbish, even though I you know, made three mistakes, but I actually made 30 great things happen. Mm -hmm. um, so one was a mindset, and, and secondly, I remember we did fitness testing, yeah. and again, I was always thought I was one of the fittest, yeah, and I was nowhere near the top, mm -hmm. um, and I just thought, you know, one of the easiest things to improve is your fitness. Yeah. Like some people are born with these amazing skills, which just some people are never going to be able to get to, even how hard you practice. But you feel like you can always work on your fitness. Yes, there'll be a, a you know a ceiling. I remember I went away and, and worked pretty hard on my fitness, and that's something that's car I've carried through with me. Is you know the fitter you are, the easier yeah. things are. Um, so why not why not try and be as fit as you can? Um, so yeah, so those two things certainly changed from year to year and also just being a year older you know I was 14 yeah. at the time came back so that was year 10 came back in year 11 um still under 16s and you know you do you do grow I guess in in that year um but yeah those two things definitely mindset and and fitness was it was a big one for me that's cool and like I said the rest is history now and look where you are today which is ace. <laughs> Um, and then on the flip side, like you, you've had lots of accomplishments and probably still more to come. Um, but at present, what are you, what are you most proud of uh, and why? Um, off the pitch, well, that's linked to on the pitch. So yeah. at, off the back of the Rio Olympics, we um, the team got MBEs, which was uh, yeah. special. Um, so... The day that I got my MBE, I took my gran down to Buckingham Palace. So we were allowed to bring three family members with me and I took her down. And um, I think that it, just because how like her age, yeah. um, she'd grown up with the royal family, I think she, she loved every minute of it, um, which was really amazing to see. And 
you know, it, it's, it, it was a big day out for her. I think she was 85, six at the wow. time, you know, to go down to London on the train and whatnot and get dressed up. And um, one of my other teammates that was there, she bought her grand, so they were chatting. And um, yeah, that was really special just because she absolutely loved it. Yeah. Um, so to see her there because she doesn't she doesn't watch any of my matches live. She doesn't come down like she's too old. Um, she can't really watch TV that much. She can't see. So um, yeah, to, to share that with her was amazing. Um, and obviously, you know, winning gold at, at Rio was pretty special. Um, the biggest thing that stands out for me is kind of how we won it. We weren't we, we weren't a team full of stars. We didn't have the most skillful players. Yeah. But we were the best team um, yeah. and we 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 ground out all the victories we won in all different ways we put in you know a really accomplished performance and won 3-0 pretty pretty comfortably or we came back from behind and won in the last three four minutes we were sitting pretty up at 3-0 and got a couple of players sent off and it got to 3-2 pretty quick and we we ground it out like we there was all different types of kind of victories and yeah. Um, yeah, just the way we stuck stuck at it as a team, um, stuck to script, didn't get too excited, didn't get ahead of ourselves. Um, yeah, it was was amazing. Yeah, and talk to me when you were on that podium with that gold medal around your neck. What what were you thinking in your head there? Don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, when uh, when the anthem came on. And we all like turned to look at the flag, like being raised, singing the national anthem. That was, yeah, I can still vividly remember that for sure. And how that felt, it was just, whoa, my God, we've actually done it. Um, yeah, and just being able to be as a team. And then after that, then everyone else came on the pitch in terms of like our coaching staff and like the team behind the team and yeah. um, got a photo of everyone together. So not just 16 on the pitch, but the, the three other girls that were reserves, unfortunately didn't get to play. Um, and then the nine, 10, 11 staff members that we had with us out at that time, just that whole picture with us all together is, is something which is super special because yeah, without using all the cliches, it was a, a team effort and without, yeah everybody there there's no way we would have been able to do what we did no yeah and I, was, I was speaking on this series to uh, barbara walsh uh, who was one of my old pe teachers yeah uh, and, and she was talking about through her through her obviously her girls were playing as well and talking about that you had uh, a saying which was gold medal thinking is that right and everything you did was about gold medal thinking yeah uh, i think that was um that was london cycle that was yeah, very yeah. much like when they were going towards the London Olympics, that was their, yeah, philosophy. Yeah. Um, now we, we did change it a bit for the Rio, Rio oh. cycle, but yeah, both, both philosophies of thinking were super powerful and, and worked for each group at the time. What are shown as three non-negotiable behaviours that you'd expect from yourself or anybody else you come into contact with? Sporting wise? I just no, anything. Anything. Um, okay, we'll go for the first one on the, on the training pitch is train hard, yeah. work hard when you're training. That's simple. Like if you're not going to do it on the pitch while we're training, like you can't just expect to turn it on in a match. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's habit, it's consistency. Um, second thing, say hello, be nice, be polite, say hello, ask people how they are. Um, yeah. It's a very simple one. Even if you don't like the person, you can always ask them how they are and walk on. <laughs> um, and thirdly, be uh, grateful for what you have. I think um, some people can get like caught up in their own world and think they deserve X, Y, and Z. And actually, you just need to be grounded, um, be appreciative of what you have um don't take things for granted um don't get too ahead of yourself um whoever, whoever you are you're still a normal person to keep your feet on the ground and then last one if, if sean if you were to go back to being a 12 year old girl okay back at school uh, what advice would you give yourself knowing what you know now um 
couple of things, I think. Uh, firstly is don't be so harsh on yourself. Yeah. So like I touched on before, it was always, I did this wrong, I did that wrong, I was rubbish. And it, the, you know, the, the cycle of negative mm. self-talk and putting pressure on myself it just wasn't healthy at that stage. Yeah. Um, and I feel, if I was still like that now, there's no way that I could survive um, the demands of international hockey. Um, secondly, like invest in the mental side of things. So I think, you know, 15, 20 years ago, talking to a sports psychologist would be a bit fluffy. Mm. People wouldn't really want to go and go there. I think, nah, I don't need that. Like, yeah. go there. They, they're there to help you. Just just like, you know, a physio is there to, to help you, um, you know, fix things which are going wrong in your body um, or need improving. The psychologist is there to help improve things that's going on in your mind. Yeah. Um, it's not a sign of weakness at all. So a um, big part of my job now is is the mentality side, the mental side of things. It's it's so important to be strong mentally. Unfortunately, I've seen a couple, yeah, way too many players just fall away yeah. because they're not mentally, yeah. I guess, strong, ready, fit enough to perform at this level, which is so sad to watch because they've got so much talent. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And I touch on that show. I think that's the school's job as well, and a, and a coach's job. You actually give give those pupils and those players the tools to do that. Mm -hmm. like, we don't do that. I think we just yeah. expect pile on pressure, and we don't tell them actually when the pressure's on, what what sort of tools in your toolbox can you use to yeah correct that. And I think that's give a, them a toolbox. I've I've got my toolbox, my you know yeah. psychology toolbox, and also you know my physio uh, rehab toolbox to help yeah. keep my body ticking over going I've got the same for the mental side of things and um, you know it's not a weakness it's something that you should learn at, at, at a younger age both for sports and also life in general no definitely have you read the um, the mind management chimp paradox book yeah I have and I uh, when I was I think I, how old was I I was a teenager 15 16 17 I went on this um youth sport trust uh like camp it was and he was there and he gave a talk to us all and i was like oh, okay this is a different way of thinking like yeah. let's 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 get into this a bit more and yeah i read the book and um yeah just encourage you to explore different things and just talk to people yeah you know just just talk and explain how you're feeling yeah so important no brilliant and then what what's the future hold what next <sighs> well <laughs> who knows with covid yeah. <laughs> Now, luckily, things seem to be improving pretty well. Um, enjoying hearing some more positive news come out um, with all the vaccinations. So, you know, if all goes to plan, fingers crossed, we, um, we GB Hockey, have a couple of matches against Ireland coming up soon. Uh, we've got a warm weather trip to try and get used to the humidity that Tokyo will present to us as players. Um, yeah. For England, we've got the European Championships in June, um, and that'll act as a World Cup qualifier as well. Yeah. Uh, fingers crossed, we should have some home matches in the Pro League, so for GB, uh, some weekends in May. Uh, and then after that, we hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll have Tokyo in July and August. Exciting. And then who knows? <laughs> yeah, that well, sounds exciting. Yeah, it's fairly busy. <laughs> Yeah, good. And then last question for me, obviously from, from Nottingham, aren't you from originally? Yeah. Uh, are you a Notts Forest or Not Notts County fan? Uh, neither. I did. Um, I did used to go to watch Forest with my uh, grandpa when they used to have this offer. It was like kids for a quid. Yeah. Um, so I used to get to go with him. I think it was up to about ten years old. I remember going to the city ground. Um, no, I, I don't follow either, unfortunately. Um, do follow football. Um, big fancy football player. We've got a league in the GB women's team. Uh, where um, are you in the league at the moment? Well, if you'd asked me about two months ago, I was sitting bottom. Oh, right. Um, okay. And above me is a girl that just doesn't even touch her team. So that was quite <laughs> embarrassing. Uh, and now I'm second. So doing pretty well. Wow, what a comeback. Yeah, I've, I've done well over the last uh, eight weeks or so. So, yeah, doing well. Enjoy enjoy the competitiveness of that. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time. Really, really appreciate it.